Welcome back to the Arsenal Pass YouTube channel. It's Hayden here, and if you don't already know, I'm a pretty big Kano fan. Like I mentioned earlier, from Arsenal Pass, uh, playing Kano. You see our Reiner opponent tap out here. Um, after not, in, a card has not been intimidated. Uh, Kano, so now turn. Because following this up for the action point, it was an energy potion that he likely saw off the top with that song. 36 team. blues, you know, we saw Alexander Vors. So he's actually gonna do 36 damage here, and the lesson will grab the blazing, and he's gonna let that last yeah. game resolve, and there goes the hand. This video is all about packing as much information as possible about how to master Kano Drakaya Vaitha in Class Constructed into a tight video package. So I'm going to be bringing you all the things from picking up Kano for the very first time, if it might be your first time approaching Kano, how to make sure you avoid some of the really common pitfalls, some of the tips and tricks to make sure you keep in your back pocket to avoid basically all those mistakes that you learn through the first 50 games of Kano, right through to mastering that Aether Wildfire combo to more advanced and intermediate tips and tricks and things to keep in mind. We're also going to discuss Dynasty and how that has impacted Kano and I'm going to present my current deck list for Kano and what I'm doing in this meta. So, let's get into it. Whether old hat or new to playing Kano, I think one of the most important things you can recognize when it comes to playing Kano in Class Constructed is why or why you shouldn't play Kano for any given event or meta game. You can look at this like a list of pros or cons and that's kind of what I've done here. So top of the list really for me has to be the fact that Kano attacks on a different axis. Flesh and Blood primarily a combat damage based game and while we do have split damage and you see decks in the form of Icelander playing attack actions, Kano does it completely differently by being a full arcane damage deck which definitely has its perks and benefits in the right meta. Multiplicative damage output is definitely another massive reason to pick up and want to play Kano. Cards like Aether Flare, Wildfire of course, ways to end into Blazing Aether, Sonic Boom, all these ways to draw and continue to push arcane damage in a multiplicative way is, is huge. It's a big reason to want to play Kano, especially into formats where people aren't prepared to be able to combat this type of offense. You can't go past the Aether Wildfire combo, of course. Having this big, massive endgame combo that can just blow your opponents out is a huge, huge reason, probably the biggest reason that you want to be playing Kano in any given format. You can also take advantage of expected metagames, something that we did at Pro Tour New Jersey. I looked to do it at World Championships. When a format is not prepared for Kano or doesn't have the availability of slots to dedicate to Arcane Barrier or doesn't want to for whatever reason, Kano is a great choice. So understanding when this could happen is going to lead you to having a lot of success when you pick Kano at the right times. Kano is hard to interact with. Arcane damage, especially multiplicative damage that continues to grow and grow and grow, is really hard to deal with if the opponent isn't set up and ready for it. Now they might have Arcane Barrier in their sideboard, but if they can't use it effectively, like an aggro deck with 14, 15 blues and three arcane barrier, then it isn't going to be effective against you and you're still going to be able to push through and push over it. When we start talking about cards like Oasis Respite, you know, and, and Spell Void, that's a bit of a different story. Kano has a lot more winnable game states than almost any other deck or hero in Class Constructed. And, and what I mean by this is that due to Kano's ability, you know, that Kano activated ability and the form of your damage adding up and multiplying, plus the wildfire combo, plus all the tomes that you play in your deck to draw extra cards. Kano just has all these different ways that it can win the game out of nowhere. You can look at the board, survey it, and a lot of times there will be ways to find outs, albeit you might need to knock the top of the deck. Storm Striders, pretty easy, simple one to end off. Storm Striders is a massive reason to play Kano. It is one of the most powerful equipments in the game. While Kano is certainly powerful, there's also a lot of reasons to not play Kano. And, and top of that list really has to be the rate of damage that you output is lower than average. If you look at what all these decks are doing right now and playing on this kind of matrix of trying to overachieve four per card or even three per card, which is pretty standard, you know, sort of rate three. People are trying to play fours, fives, and get those sort of values out of their cards. Think blue plus a wounded bull for eight, or blue plus fiend or fighting spirit for eight, or even snatch for four. On the flip side of that, we're doing things like coming in with a crucible plus a Voltic for six off two cards. You know, Sonic Boom is only four damage off two cards. But of course, what adds up is all the extra damage over the top, something like Sonic Boom with on-hit effects. So that's what you have to weigh up. In mid is where people can interact easily with the arcane damage, where your arcane damage is already below rate, you're going to have a hard time playing Kano. That feeds nicely into just talking about the fact that Kano can be interacted with, and if people are set up for it, you know, with arcane barrier that they can utilize with resources, or they do have spell void available in their deck, or cards like Oasis Respite, Erinus Prayer, things of this nature, they can interact with you, especially if they have a good plan to do so. Lastly is the 30 life problem, and this ties into the other two points above it. Basically, starting on lower life than your opponent, especially against decks that can apply pressure 
and deal with your arcane damage in a reasonable sort of way or even stop part of your combo when you go off the wildfire. That makes 30 life a real problem. Now, part of it can just be mental, thinking that, well, I'm starting on 10 less life than my opponent. I'm already losing the game. But the power of Kano, cards like Stormstrider's Ragamuffin's Hat, plus your wildfire combo, all this multiplicative of damage means that starting at 30 life really is just balancing the hero and you definitely aren't losing the game. You're at 30 and your opponent's at 40. But the real problem is when that 30 life starts to drain away and your damage is under rate. If you're brand new to Kano and Classic Constructed or you're fairly beginner with Kano and Classic Constructed, then I'm gonna give you some tips and tricks and some pitfalls to avoid to make those first 50 to 100 games a lot easier than they would be if you just picked it up raw and tried to do it yourself. The first basic concept of Kano that you're really gonna to wanna to hit on is playing on your own turn. Now because of Kano's ability, a lot of people think when they first observe and pick up the hero, I've gotta find ways to play on my opponent's turn. Try and try and get the value. Maybe they're down on resources, they've, they've, you know, they've gone shields down, and I just need to push through some damage. Kano a card off the top. The problem is you're paying an extra three resources to play a card, when in reality, what you could be doing is just playing on your own turn. So that's definitely the first key basic of Kano, is try as much as possible Unless you're going for these big sort of combo turns or you're going to push lethal damage, you want to primarily be playing on your own turn with Kano. This ties into the second ability. It's not overusing Kano. Now, if you're playing a lot on your own turn, then you're going to you're gonna master that basic pretty quickly and you're not going to overuse Kano's ability. The times where you want to use Kano's ability is when you know what's on top of your deck, you know the values there. You are in a position where you could potentially kill the opponent or you're looking down the barrel of lethal and you need to find ways to try and kill the opponent. The main reason that you're going to use Kano's ability is because it's free though. So your opponent's turn, they set up maybe a potion themselves or they do something that's pretty non-interactive. You don't get the chance to defend with cards and they kind of go, you know, they, they go shields down. They have no resources available to them. Now you might have a handful of blue cards and you could Kano on your own turn to, to use those cards up, but you could also Kano on your opponent's turn and punish them for not having resources available. Now this gets, starts to get a little bit complicated as to whether you should or shouldn't do this, but the first thing you should look to do is first of all, Play on your own turn. If you have a red plus a blue, let's say a red Volta Bolt and a blue plus two other blues, well, the first thought should be, I should play this red Volta Bolt on my turn and then go from there as to whether you should or shouldn't use Kano's ability. Like the example with the red Volta Bolt, the next key sort of basic you want to master with Kano is playing these two card hands. I use that example when the point above, you know, red Volta Bolt plus a blue in hand, play on your opponent's turn. And the best way to do this is to just play two card hands. Now, you might be tempted to keep extra blues and Kano off the top to potentially find some more damage. More than likely with the number of blues that you can play in Kano, you're about 50-50 just to hit another blue that's gonna do very little damage. And you're looking at now playing, you know, if you have two extra blues in hand, plus the blue that's gonna play, pay for your Volta Bolt, use those other two blues to see what's on top, you're probably spending two cards for two, three damage. And that's really not a good rate or output. So a lot of the time you're not gonna wanna do that. What you're gonna wanna do instead is try and defend with those two cards and then play with two card hands on your own turn or defend with one card, play with two cards on your turn and Arsenal a really key piece like an Aether Wildfire, a Lessons in Lava, or a future card that you can play on a two card hand. Let's use the example, we have two blues in hand, a Sonic Boom and a Voltic Bolt. We might defend with one of the blues and then on our turn, play out the Voltic Bolt off, a crucible of, uh, off the Crucible of Aether Weave for six damage, Arsenal that Sonic Boom for a future turn. Fourth point for mastering the basics of Kano is defend. You start at 30 life and there's this real sort of, I think, guess inclination for a lot of newer players that approach Kano to just like, I need to kill my opponent as fast as possible. My, my life isn't relevant until it hits zero. But when you're playing two cut hands, you're not overusing Kano's ability and doing all these things that we've kind of talked about before, what you're gonna find is that defending is really good. Defend with two cards, play out a card from hand. Defend with a card, play out a card from hand, arsenal a card. Defend with three cards and arsenal a card. Maybe your hand is just weak and full of bad blues. You can actually find and get to better turns in the game. Find your combo, the wildfire combo, all these good cards like sonic booms and, and tomes and things if you defend and get to that stage of the game. Like many heroes in Flesh and Blood, the Arsenal plays a massive role in what Kano is trying to do, maybe more so than majority of other heroes in this game. The Arsenal slot is super important. We talked about playing off two card hands and you know putting relevant key pieces into Arsenal by defending with other cards. Now, you can use your Arsenal for things like you know a future chip spell, like the Voltic Bolt or the Sonic Boom, like we talked about. Of course, for the uh, Aether Wildfire, Lesson Lavas of the World, Blazing Aethers, your combo pieces, but also for things like Tome of Fiendale and slower grindier games, they're going to help you to gain back life. The Arsenal is really, really important. And what you want to be careful of once you're sort of, you know, you're getting the basics and you start to move on from there is you want to be careful about what you're actually putting into Arsenal. Basically, never put a blue in Arsenal unless it's Energy Potion because the card's amazing, uh, but just be really careful of what you're actually using your Arsenal for. It's a really powerful tool for Kano. 
over sideboarding or pre-boarding, this is a, a massive trap that a lot of people fall into with Kano. Nowadays, the Kano builds really revolve around Aether Wildfire and Classic Constructors, as they should. It's such a powerful card. And one of the worst things you can do to make your deck worse is just add more cards. You know, maybe you're playing to something like Dromai, and you have this idea that, well, I just need poppers. I need six attacks on my sideboard, or I need three red damp, and I need three red uh, Aether Dart, and I need, you know, as many cards as that can kill dragons. I need three red Singe as well. These cards are all great in isolation and in the right situation against your opponent, but what they're also doing is taking away from your main plan, which is to combo off and kill your opponent. So just keep it simple. Don't over sideboard. My kind of general rule of thumb with Kano is that you probably shouldn't be changing your deck by more than five or six cards in any given matchup. Now, knowing how long the game is roughly going to last is going to allow you to understand how quickly you need to assemble your uh, combo or what cards you're trying to dig for in that matchup. Now, the example I use against uh, of this is Against an aggressive deck, the game's going to be really quick, right? Even if you defend and play two-card hands, the game against something like Fire could go two, three, four turns, probably, somewhere between two to four turns. So you know roughly the target on the wall of what you need to do. You know in that matchup, estimated turns is two to four turns. I need to find my combo as fast as possible and get a little bit of chip damage in. Now, when you're playing against something like Guardian, you can probably estimate that the game's going to be a lot longer. And you can start to think about the cards that are going to be more relevant to that matchup. Time of Fiendel, for instance, you have more time to get that card into Arsenal, more time to play it out drop the cards and gain the life. So by estimating how long the game is going to last, it gives you a lot of information around what you should be trying to do, how much chip damage you should be trying to do versus how much you know you should be focusing on your combo. Longer game, you can get through more chip damage, present more threats. Shorter game, you really want to focus on just getting to that combo as fast as possible and ideally getting in one or two hits of chip damage. Now, this is a, a, a pretty basic one that a lot of people grasp really quickly, but then sometimes it feels sort of non-intuitive to do this. But when you're starting out with Kano, the best thing to do is keep your Storm Strides and Ragamuffin's hat for as long as possible. That should be the way that you finish out the game. Try not to get tempted just to push 12, 13, 14 damage by using one or two of these equipment in the mid game. You want to try and close out the game with it because it allows you to do, if you have both at the same time, it allows you to do sort of exponential sort of things with your combo turn. And uh, we're going to talk about the combo shortly, but keep your Ragamuffin's hat and Storm Strides as long as possible. Exceptions to this, maybe you can deal with like 36, 38 damage, doesn't quite kill your opponent, but gets into close to lethal, you often pop them. Last, but probably most importantly, if you're trying to master the basics of Kano and Class Constructed, is know the wildfire combo. Know the cards that are involved, know the sequencing, and roughly know the resources you're going to need to do this. Now, the Kano combo can vary depending on what cards you have in hand, what's on top of your deck, what line of the combo you're going through, but it's all going to revolve around wildfire, something else, and then a blazing ether. And if you can make sure that you know what these cards are, that you need at least 10 resources roughly to go off, then it's going to help you not be fuddling through this the first few times you're trying to do it. It's going to make it a lot easier to just do the combo and practice it. So those here, nine basic principles are things that are going to help you master Kano when you pick it up for the very first time. As well, if you haven't already, maybe you're new to the Arsenal Pass channel, drop us a sub, flick us a like on the video, drop in the comments as well, let us know what you think of this video. And if you'd like to see more of these videos for other heroes in the future, but with that said, basic tips done, let's move on. Now that we've got the basics mastered, the number one thing that you need to focus on is the combo. Kano and Class Constructed is all about the wildfire combo, and I don't really care about what other people say, that is the heart and soul of it. And if you want to win as many games as possible, then mastering the Aether wildfire combo is the thing you need to focus on. Now with the wildfire combo, there's a number of different lines you can take depending on the cards you draw in the game and the type of combo that you're looking to set up. In this part of the video, I'm going to cover the two most common types of the combo that you'll look for with wildfire. And as I go, I'm going to talk about the sequencing and a lot of the things that you should keep in mind if you want to master this combo and in turn, master Kano. Let's get into it. So first of all, the first one we're looking at is a Lessons in Lava line. So we've got our Aether Wildfire and Arsenal. Set this up earlier in the game, pretty standard. We also have a Lessons in Lava and three blues, including Sap, Aether Quickening, and Emeritus Scolding in our hand. Uh, and we're gonna get straight into it with Tunic on three. So first thing I look at when I look at my combo is, okay, I got my two key pieces of my combo, my Arsenal card and my Lessons in Lava. The next three things, or the next thing rather, is three cards in my hand is these three blues, and I count up how many resources I have. I know that I have one, two, three, nine, ten, minimum 10 resources, and the next thing I want to understand is what more resources can I have in my hand? Because part of the combo I'm going to do is I'm going to ragamuffins, ragamuffins hat, and put this Lessons in Lava on top of my deck so that it can be Kano'd off and be played. Now, I'm going to be drawing a random card into my hand that I'm going to be using for resources. That could be a red, could be a yellow, could be a blue. And that's going to determine what I can do with this combo. So if I have a blue, well, I now know that I have 9, 12, 13 total resources. A red's going to be 
11 total resources, yellow 12, of course. So that's what I'm gonna play with. So the first thing I wanna do is try and get as much information as possible about my combo by finding out what that top card is on my deck before I make any decisions about what resources I wanna use with Metacarpus Nodes and Crucible of War, because I know that my base resource count that I need is gonna be two, three, four, plus two Kano's, minimum 10 resources. I know that I'm gonna have minimum 11 resources, so I can definitely at least Crucible of Etherweave, but if I didn't have this tunic counter, I wouldn't be able to do that. So I always want as much information as I can possibly garner when I'm going for the wildfire combo. So first thing we're gonna do with the wildfire combo is we're going to stack some Kano's up so that we start to dump cards out of our hand because the last, basically you work backwards. What are the last two things that we want to happen? Well, the last two things that we want to happen is to play a Blazing Aether is the very last thing that we want to do. And that's gonna happen before that by playing a Lessons in Lava to find it. And the last, so the last two things we want to do is two Kano's basically. So going to activate Kano once, pitching this blue, going to activate Kano twice, pitching another blue. So we now have two Kanos available to us. Little dice there that are now sitting on the chain uh, that, well, on the stack that we haven't used yet. So they're waiting. So we have priority still. We can always hold priority and continue to do the things you want to do until we're ready to pass priority and let the, uh, the stack, the chain resolve. So next thing we're going to do is we're going to now activate our Storm Striders. So we could Crucible here because we do have the total resources, but if we didn't have the tunic counter, we could potentially not be able to Crucible on this turn if we had a read off the top. So always play it safe, getting the most information as possible. We'll activate the Storm Striders first. That's gonna cost us a resource. So now we're gonna have two resources floating. And we're gonna wait. We're not gonna let this resolve just yet because the first thing we can do is that we can uh, find out the resources we have on top because we might wanna Crucible as well. So we'll now Ragamuffin's hat and draw the card on our top. It's a blue, it's an eye of Aphidia. So we now know that we have the total maximum resources that we're looking for, which is gonna be 13. We'll put the Lessons in Lava back on top of the deck. Now we're okay to let the Storm Strider resolve. Uh, we'll pay one into our Crucible, because we know that we can afford this now. So pay for the Crucible. And then we're gonna go ahead and play the Aether Wildfire out, thanks to the Storm Striders. So we'll go, we'll pitch this blue. Uh, we'd usually opt, but we don't need to worry about doing that here. It's gonna cost us two resources, two left. And then we know we can also pay for this Metacarpus nodes because we have effectively two additional resources still left. One's committed for our Lessons in Lava. Let's call that the Tunic. We have two resources left. So we'll pay for one. So that total, we're looking at six damage coming through off the wildfire. Now, now this six damage is gonna depend on, of course, what additional sort of debuffs. So Arcane Barrier, Spell Void that our opponent has available to us. And I'm gonna go through this quick sort of cheat math that you can do on that after we go through the combos. So we'll just stick to saying right now, what's the full potential of the combo? And then I'll give you this really easy offhand sort of way that you can uh, calculate this really quickly that you can keep in your back pocket. So we'll go through the wildfire first. We've activated the Metacarpus. So this is a trigger that happens when we play it. It's happened, six damages here. And now we can, this is resolved. We can then allow, this is all resolved. We can then allow one of these Kano's to resolve. So we'll let the first Kano resolve. That's gonna see our lessons in lava. We're then gonna hold priority again, keep that priority with us. And we're actually gonna play the lessons in lava. Uh, so before the, we actually play the Lessons in Lava, what we'll do is we'll just remove the Tunic. So we'll play the Lessons in Lava. It's going to cost us one. Metacarpus is going to trigger again. We'll pump the resource into it because we have the resource available. If we didn't have the Tunic counter, we'd just be playing the Lessons, of course, for nine here, but we get 10 out of it thanks to this. So coming in for 10 damage. Of course, then we can go and search for this Blazing, which is the last piece of the puzzle. Now we can let this last Kano resolve. Get the blazing off the top and we'll play it. Of course, it's gonna be for the 16 we've already dealt plus the extra six, so that's gonna be for 22. And in total, we're looking at 38 damage there. Now, so if we didn't have that uh, resource on Spring Tunic, but we still hit the blue that we were looking for, or maybe we had a yellow instead of the blue off that Ragamuffin's hat, like we're talking about with the resources, we'd be looking at 36 damage. But I will go through what that math looks like and a little bit of a cheat sheet at the end. All right, we've taken a look at the Lessons in Lava Wildfire combo, which is the one that I would suggest that you always aim for. It's the most powerful version of the Wildfire combo that you can do the most consistent because you always know what's gonna be on top and it gives you really good damage output. Um, now, let's take a look at another one that's pretty common, which is, of course, having our Wildfire already set up an Arsenal, but we could also have the other card, same as before. The Lessons in Lava could have swapped with the Wildfire. Anytime with Lessons in Lava and Wildfire, either one, I'm really happy to Arsenal, especially an aggressive matchup and look for the second half of the combo. Blazing Aether, I'm less keen on arsling this card, but this is a pretty common line as well. So three blues, Blazing Aether again in our hand here, and we're looking at a slightly different line of the combo this time. Now, because 
we don't have the lessons in lava, which is going to then go and find the blazing ether. What we're effectively missing from the last combo that we just did is we're missing the middle piece of the combo. We're missing that damage spell. So what we're looking to do now is to activate Kano to find the middle piece, effectively our lessons in lava, because we already have the blazing ether, which is going to be ragamuffins on top. So we'll go through it. So first things first is we just want to know, can we do this? Because if there was an energy potion on top or a card we couldn't possibly or potentially not even pay for, uh, we, we might not either fit here. We, we wouldn't be able to do this. So this first thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and activate the Kano and we're going to find out what's on top. Okay, so we have a blue prognosticate on top, which is a one damage, zero cost spell, which is going to be our middle piece of the combo. Now, next thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and we want to know, same as last time, we want to know how many resources we're playing with, what we can do total combo in this turn. So we know the last thing we want to do is for a Blazing Ether Resolve. So we're happy to let it play a Kano and we're going to hold that again on the chain. And then next thing is, what do we want to do before that? Well, the next thing we do before that is we play the Prognosticate. So now we're in a situation where we actually want to play the, the Wildfire first. But we want to find out how many resources we have. So uh, we want to then go ahead. We have currently zero resources floating. We'll go ahead and do the same thing as before. We'll activate the Storm Striders. Again, we just want as much information as possible before we end up using this Crucible in case we don't have the right resource. Of course, in the situation, again, we've got the Tunic again. If we didn't have the tunic or we had a two cost off the top, then we'd have to look again to understand our maximum amount of resources. So I always play it this way because I just want to gain the most information possible. So now we're going to hold this again and we're going to activate the, activate the Ragamuffin's hat. We're going to draw a card. We find a blue Aether Quickening, so maximum amount of resources, so we're fine to go. There is 33 blues in this. You can often just find a blue off the top with Ragamuffins, which is great. And then now we're going to go ahead and uh, we can let the Storm Stories resolve. And we can... Also play Crucible. One resource. And now we're ready to play Wildfire. We'll go ahead and we will push the Aether Quickening. And a couple of snows are going to trigger. We'll pay for the trigger. And we're looking again at our full six damage. Again, we still have this Kano ready for our Blazing. So six damage coming in. And then we'll go to our next part of the chain. Play the Prognosticate, of course. We're looking at one plus the six already doubts. So looking at seven. But we do have resources available for this Metacarpus. So we'll pay for the Metacarpus. So we're coming through for that total of eight. And then last things last, let the Kano resolve, trigger resolve. Here's the Blazing Aether with the Tunic Counter. And we'll play it. And we can also activate Metacarpus again because we hit that blue. We have the Tunic. We have all the resources we need to be able to do this turn. So, of course, we're looking at, what, 14 damage here. So 14 plus the 1, 15 plus the 6 on top. So, so Blazing Aether there. And we've got a total of the 14 damage we've already dealt plus the 1 from the Metacarpus. That's 15. Uh, plus the 6 from the Blazing Aether. So we're looking at 21 off this Blazing Aether. 27 plus the 8. Looking at 35. So with all those max amount of resources, we've added a lot of damage to What is actually effectively, if we didn't have any additional resources this turn, what we'd actually be looking at is 4 off the Wildfire, just 5 off of this. And then, of course, that would mean that on the Blazing, we're only coming in for 9 plus 4, 13. Uh, so in total, it gives us access to the turn for 13, 18, just base 22 damage. So you can see the exponential damage that Metacarpus nodes and Crucible Ether Weave, and I'll get into that math right now. All right, the last thing I want to leave you with with the Wildfire combo is a bit of a, a bit of a cheat sheet, a bit of a trick you can put in your back pocket to make this combo turn super, super easy and to understand the math and your damage thresholds in, you know, five, 10 seconds really easily. So what this effectively is, is understanding your base damage first of all, and then applying a bit of a, uh, a plus or minus math to your damage to understand on any given turn with any given amount of resources and depending on what your opponent can do, how much damage you can actually output. So the first thing to understand, what is our base damage? So the two combos that we just looked at, the Lessons and Lava combo, which is the most consistent combo, the one you're going to want to go for the most, that base damage is 26 damage, like I talked about. The uh, random card off the top, in this case it was a Prognosticate, so one damage on the middle as opposed to three with Lessons and Lava, that equal to a base damage of 22. Now, of course, the combo I went through, we had some buffs on there, and I'm going to explain how that math is so easy to work out with those buffs uh, or if our opponent had some debuffs in the form of Spell Void or Arcane Barrier. First thing you want to understand is that on Chain Link 1, no matter what the combo you're doing here is, so no matter what the second card is, and uh, once you get to the Blazing Aether, the damage is going to go plus or minus 5. So the base damage on, uh, on an Aether Wildfire, of course, is 4. So let's use the Lessons in Lava line. That would be 26 total damage. If we had a 1 extra resource to Crucible, that would get up to 5 on the Wildfire, and that's an additional 5 for the turn. So we're looking at 31 damage now. If we also had a resource to Metacarpus Nodes, then we're looking at 36 damage. That's a part of what we showed you in the last uh, part of this video with the Lessons in Lava combo line. So let's take it the other way. Our opponent has uh, Spell Void 2. So we can pay into the Metacarpus and the Crucible, but our opponent 
Valve Wars 2. Well, we're plus 10, but then we're also minus 10. So we're back to the base of 26. Maybe our opponent, you know, we don't have any additional resources, but our opponent has one floating. They can minus five off our total damage output. Our wildfire goes down to three. That means that our total damage output for the turn is actually going to be 21 on the combo turn. So really simple way to do it. It's just plus or minus five, depending on resources and being dumped in from yours or your opponent's side. On chain link two, whether that's a lessons lava, it's a prognosticate, it's a, uh, it's a, you know, a scolding rain, whatever it is on that second chain, that's going to be plus or minus two, depending on each resource that's dumped into it. So if we also have a spare resource to Metacarpus nodes, that one on our big lessons in lava turn, like we did, well, we'll be at 38 damage, which is exactly what we showed in the last one. That lessons in lava went to instead of being uh, for nine damage, it was 10 damage, which means it's a total damage output of plus two for the turn. Chain link two, plus or minus two for each resource. On the last one, it's just going to be plus or minus one. It's the last card in the chain. There's no multiplicative effect of the damage dealt. So the total damage on the turn is just going to be plus or minus one. So to reiterate, the reason this is all happening is because of the multiplicative damage aspect of it. On the chain link one with wildfire, it's going to be plus or minus five for each resource. Chain link two, plus or minus two for each resource. And then on the final one, the blazing ether, it's plus or minus one. So hopefully that little trick is going to make it really easy for you to do this combo. I think it does. It's something that I learned sort of the day before Pro Tour New Jersey to make sure I knew exactly how much damage I could have on any given turn with the combo. I practiced it a little bit. I sat there, I goldfished all my combo lines and just went through the math and it made it super, super easy on the day to understand, okay, I have a total of 13 resources. I know my base combo with Lessons in Lava is 10 resources and I have three additional resources to pump in. I can potentially look and be looking at 38 damage. Oh, I think my opponent has a blue here and I think they're going to make my wildfire minus three. That means minus 15 damage, right? So I'm looking at 21, uh, 23 damage here. So things like that. It makes it really easy to work out the math and I think it's going to help you to just smash the combo out every time that you uh, draw into it. All right, we've got the basics of Kano down. We've mastered the wildfire combo. Now what do we do next? Well, now we start hitting those intermediate and more advanced Kano tips and tricks to make sure that we get the most out of this hero and win as many games as we possibly can. If you truly want to master Kano in Class Constructed, top of the list has to be know the ins and outs of all the math for the wildfire combo. Now, in the previous part of this video, I go through the wildfire combo and at the end, there is a part on all of the sort of buffs and debuffs and the breakpoints and values of resources and the math that you should know. It's really simple math that you can keep on hand and do really quickly if you know what a plus or minus, whether it be you know an arcane bear on your opponent's side, crucible ether weave or metacarpus node trigger on your side, and what that's going to do to your wildfire, your middle card, and then your blazing ether. It's really simple. It's always the same. So if you learn it, you can do this math really quickly and know exactly what damage you have before you go off in the space of about ten or fifteen seconds. You know the math, now practice all of the iterations of the wildfire combo. There's so many different ways that you can wildfire combo, whether it be double wildfire, whether it be lessons in lava, whether it be a nondescript blue that comes in the middle, whether it be an aether flare, whether it be double blazing on the end of a blue, there's three versus four spells on the combo turn. There's so many different ways you can do it. What does energy potion do to your math? The advice I have is just goldfish this. Just sit down, goldfish possible iterations, go through as many iterations with no energy potion, Go through as many iterations with tuna counter or you know your spellfire cloak go through with energy potion find out all the different iterations you can do so that when you go and play this in actual match it just comes straight to your mind it's super easy and uh it, you'll definitely get rewarded for it the bit i want to add on to this as well is just maximize your information so there's a few different ways to sequence the wildfire combo that are really important and then give you the most information possible. The quickest one i can give to you is that a lot of people activate crucible of ether weave in order to dump the last card to be able to rag a muffin's hat when in reality, the best way to actually do this is to activate your Storm Striders when you, before you do the Ragged Mountains hat. And the reason for this is because you might not have enough resources after you combo, depending on what's on top of your deck, if you're going for a blind flip. Make sure you really nail down the priority and the importance of some of the most important cards in your deck for any given matchup. Now, what I mean by this is take a card like Energy Potion. That Energy Potion is great in every single matchup, but the longer a game goes, you can have more opportunities to get these Energy Potions out. In a game that's going to go longer, you can afford to block or defend with some of your combo pieces or even pitch them in priority of playing an energy potion. And against an aggressive deck like Fi, that's going to be a lot harder to do. You might need to prioritize the combo and energy potion is going to be lower down on the list. Toma Fiendale, great into your slower grind deer matchups where you can actually get into Arsenal and pay for it. In an aggressive matchup where it's taking up that all-important Arsenal slot and a game that's going to be two or three turns, you might not even have time to get it off. 
a very different story. So make sure you understand what these cards are doing in every single matchup. The other one I want to talk about is Toma Etherwind. That card is really, really high priority into slower grindier matchups for doing big sort of in-game pushes of damage. So pitching those cards is really high priority in those matchups versus defending or playing with them in some of the, you know, the, the faster, uh, less grindy matchups. Listen in Lava. You want to make sure you have something like a Lesson in Lava, at least one left in your deck against a really grindy matchup. Against an aggressive matchup, you can use these a lot more sort of on your turn to chip damage and go and find more Lessons in Lava or even the Aether Wildfire to set up your combo as soon as possible. Not only is it knowing the priority and the importance of key cards in each matchup, but knowing what you should be arsenaling in every single matchup is really important as well. I talk about in the basics of Kano, the arsenal is the most important, one of the most important tools that Kano has and it really is. And if you want to really master and nail down being an expert in Kano and Classic Constructed, then you should know as much as possible what the key cards are for each matchup. Now, I'm not going to go through these in this. My recommendation would be to play the matchups, learn them, and just understand what your key cards are. But the ones that come to mind is holding a card for a turn to be able to get it out to play like an energy potion, a deja vu potion. It's cards like Toma Fiendal, Toma Etherwind, pitching those later. I talked about some of these cards already, what cards you want to Arsenal and don't want Arsenal. And I think the more you play these matchups, you're going to learn them. But I think it's something that you should focus on and really try and hone and practice uh, and take sort of reflections on when you end a match. Next tip for Mastering Kano is learning when to pull the trigger, so to speak, and go all in. And this is really just understanding basically what an end game is going to look like and when there's going to be no more opportunities to do this. A good example of this is you're playing into an aggressive deck like Dash in this meta. You know, they have access to Arcane Barrier 3 probably. And the lower your life total gets, the more resources they can hold in hand and present lethal to you in the late game. So what you want to understand is when should you pull the trigger? Now, this could be a turn before you even get to lethal range because they go down to one card in hand. You might just have to take the punt that it's not a blue card and know you have lethal because you've done your math, you've done your wildfire math and be, okay, if they have a blue in hand as opposed to a yellow or red, uh, you know, I don't kill them here. But if they have the yellow or red, I win here. And a lot of times the situation is going to be, it's going to be correct to uh, to just go ahead and pull the trigger. Now, a lot of information around the turns prior and how they've played that turn out is going to give you the information about whether to pull the trigger or not. But these are the sort of situations and scenarios that you really need to identify if you want to make sure that you don't get to the end games and bleed out. And that's just about understanding when to pull the trigger and when not to. Really study what the meta decks are doing. This plays into the last point I talked about with Dash. What does Dash want to do in any given meta? What does it look like? What do their turn sequences look like? This is going to help you know things like when to pull the trigger. It's also going to just help you and enable you to know what sort of lines of play you should go through. One of the biggest things that Kano, sort of the advantage to playing Kano is that if you know what your opponent's trying to do, you get so much information on any given turn about whether you should blind flip into them, how much damage you can try and push. If you play a two card hand on your turn to push damage and they don't defend it, does that mean that they have resources up to prevent damage or simply are they trying to come back with a big turn? You know, start to identify patterns like, well, I believe they have a Command and Conquer plus Pummel here because they didn't stop all the damage here and I got a Sonic Boom trigger off against Ultim. Things like this. The more you know about what your opponent's trying to do, the more power you have as a Kano player that can play on your turn and the opponent's turn. Now, a lot of people talk about with Kano pitch stacking and how important pitch stacking is, and it can be somewhat important, but even more important than pitch stacking, if you want to master Kano, I think, is understanding the threat density left in your deck and pitch groups. And what I mean by pitch groups is how many blues have I just pitched together? How many non-blues have I just pitched together? Now, you don't need to know exactly what blues you have and what sort of reds you have if you're trying to stack an in-game combo. What's going to help you a lot more than that is just knowing, okay, bottom 12 cards in my deck, I know I have uh, four blues at the start. Those are irrelevant, so don't even worry about the four because they're not going to help me, right? Maybe I remember the top card, so I know when to get back to my pitch stack, but I'm more focused on the next cards. Then I know I have Wildfire and Lessons in Lava and three blues lay it on top so I know that when I get to that I've got the right sort of configuration of my pitch it's more about consciously pitching and thinking about the cards you're keeping in your deck you know not accidentally defending with all your blazing ethers this is you know these are the most important things that are going to help you nail this down then down the line if you have the brain capacity and you can get to pitch stacking which even I don't do in most games I think it's really really difficult then you can move on to that if you're also looking for a Dynasty Kano deck, well, at the end of this video, I do have a full deck tech, and you can also find a full sideboard guide and matchup guide available over on the Arsenal Pass Patreon. Now, if you're finding these tips helpful and enjoying this video, please drop us a like, flick us a subscribe, and uh, maybe drop us in the comments to let us know if you'd like to see more of these videos in the future and what you think of Kano in the Dynasty meta. All right, so here in front of us, finally laid out, is my current updated Dynasty Kano list that I would take into an event this weekend. Now, 
it's not too dissimilar from the list I took to the Pro Tour and my core versus sideboard is pretty similar in the structure and the way that I like to use it. So uh, if you're wondering what I played at the PT and have I made a lot of updates since then, it's a lot of uh, slight upgrades and changes depending on meta. And I'm also gonna talk about some sideboard options that you can take in depending on what you expect your meta game to be. So here in front of us is my core 57 cards. I like a really tight core with Kano. If you've heard me talk about the combo, I've alluded to it during this video as well. Don't mess with the plan too much. You want the best cards that are gonna lay the combo. And that starts with 33 blues in the main deck. Now these are breaking, broken down to our damage spells through here on the left, uh, our Emer Emeritus up here as well. And then some of these enablers as well. So I just wanna talk through some of these, these pockets. We have now access to 12 zero cost uh, for one damage spells. These are super important because they allow the consistency of the combo to be better than it was before. So all of these come in, you wanna play all 12 of these. They're great for hitting off those uh, blazing lines like you've seen in this video. Next we have Singe. Now Singe is a, it's a bit of a downgrade on maybe something like a Scalding Rain, of course. We only play two Scalding Rain uh, or, or a Volta Bolt damage wise. But because of Dromai being in the meta and I think still a really good deck in the meta, it's close to free to be able to play this. You don't lose out on too much damage wise. And what can this can do off a Crucible when you're playing into Dromai to kill something like a Kyloria uh, on your opponent's turn or take out two sort of Aether Ash Wings that might be stopping you from comboing the next turn. Really, really important. You can also pair them uh, potentially together to, at worst case, to kill something like a Themai, which is going to stop you from comboing. So next up, we've got Aether Quickening. It's just better than Scalding Rain. It's a strict upgrade. Uh, so you just play the three Aether Quickening and then the two Scalding Rain and then three Aether Flare. Aether Flare just is insane on the combo turn. If you get to hit that blindly off uh, like the blazing line I showed you, so it's Wildfire, Blue Aether Flare, and then the blazing, uh, the exponential damage on the Aether Flare is so important. So it's just another card that's just gonna enable you to do bigger than what you'd expect, bigger than the base damage of a combo turn. Meritus, uh, again, same sort of thing. It's better than a Vaulted Bot on your opponent's turn, and that's when you're gonna be blindly flipping blues. Otherwise, you're playing two card hands and you're not really playing blue cards out. So better to play that than Vaulted Bolt. And the card is really, really powerful. Just good damage. Gaze the Ages. This card is nuts. Always play this card. Uh, it just enables you to just get free digs into the deck. And if you hit this on a combo turn, it's not a whiff because you can then just play it, pitch it, and then find a better card. Uh, make sure you don't hit an eye or hit a potion or you hit the best card you could possibly find in the next two cards to combo. Plus it allows for some pretty silly shenanigans during combo turns uh, and just damage turns as well. Energy Potion might be the best card in the deck. Energy Potion is such a ridiculous card. I would say probably energy potion increases your win percentage in any given matchup by like 10 to 15%. Now, arbitrary numbers aside, whatever you want to say, energy potion is so strong. You get this down on turn zero or turn one against an aggro deck. It enables you to have the access to those resources. I went through the combo line. If you hit a red off the top, sometimes that can be so detrimental to being able to kill your opponent. Let's say you haven't done much chip damage. Your opponent's on 36. They go shields down. You have the lessons in lava, Aether Wildfire turn set up, but you've got a red in hand. Energy Potion is going to solve that problem. It effectively turns you red into a blue and allows you to still do these big combo turns. I, I is great. Uh, I mean, there is some whiff potential to I, and it's not an essential card. So if you do want to cut this or you don't own an I, really easy swap out. You can swap this out for a third Scalding Rain. Uh, you can swap it out to maybe even a Deja Vu Potion. I know some of my teammates for uh, Worlds really like Deja Vu Potion and we're always playing them in the main deck. I'm not as big a fan. I do have one on the sideboard, which I'll show you, but you can swap this to that. Uh, you can even swap it for a non-blue if you want to cut the blue count slightly, but I really like 33. So yeah, a few different options you can do there with I um, at your disposal. Next up is our yellows. These are really tight. Yellows are a bit of a weird spot in Wizard. They're not blues, which don't help us to have maximum resources for combo and do as much sort of like damage as we possibly can on you know, Kano's and, and things like that. Um, so they're a bit awkward and then they're not reds that maximize damage, but these nine yellows are super, super important. Lessons in Lava, you already know, is part of one of the best combo lines you can do in this deck. But outside of that, it just has a lot of utility uh, and probably honestly might be the most powerful card in the deck. Sonic Boom. Sonic Boom is actually probably the least powerful card in the deck or the, uh, not the least powerful. It can really have some pop-off potential, but often it can be underwhelming, especially into decks that have high arcane barrier. Sonic Boom is pretty underwhelming, but its ceiling is so high that you, you do want to run this card. Um, sometimes you get double Sonic Boom. That's pretty cool. Then Tom of Fiendale, really important into the slower matchups, but the other reason to actually play from Arsenal, gain the life back into something like Ultim or even the Icelander matchup, really, really key. But the other thing that Tome can do is that it can just dig you when you're not quite there at combo. Maybe you need to kill your opponent and the natural combo might be two or three damage off. You know, finding something like a Tome off the top, it, it isn't a whiff. Uh, it actually can end up netting you more damage because it can net you resources. It can find you pieces of the combo that you're missing. It can do a lot of things. Tome can also dig you further down. So 
Tome, including Tome at Aetherwind, really, really important. The Reds. Start down the bottom here because it's super simple. Don't really have to talk about it. Six cards that are ingrained in the combo. Aether Wildfire and Blazing. They're not going anywhere. I want to start from the top. We have six damage spells here that are going to allow us to do that sort of two-card hand play that I talked about along with Sonic Boom and Lessons in Lava and Chip Damage. That's Aether Spindle and Swell Tidings. Now, Swell Tidings is just an upgrade on Voltic Bolt. I like Voltic Bolt. I'm even playing one on the sideboard, which I'll get to. But I think this is really good for playing two-card hands. The Ponder Token is not often relevant because you're trying to control your arsenal anyway. Talked about how important Arsenal is in Kano, uh, so you already know. So it's not super relevant a lot of the time, but sometimes it is when you're trading cards. Anyway, it's just a strict, uh, strict upgrade on Voltic. Aether Spindle. This card's kind of crazy. So this card is so threatening. If you ever get this off for five when you're playing two card hands out, you can effectively make sure that you stack a Kano on top. You know, if you see, you know, three blues, a good red, and then something pretty nutty like a Sonic Boom or potentially part of your combo, uh, Aether Spindle is going to set you up to make sure that. The other thing it does when you're chipping damage with two cards is like, you know, I've got my Wildfire set up and now I'm just digging. Digging for a Lessons in Lava, digging for a Blazing. You know, Aether Spindle, they AB2, hit for three, opt three. I see, you know, a, a Swell Tidings, a Tome, a Sonic Boom on top. Put all those to the bottom. They're not helping my combo. Let's keep digging. Uh, Aether Spindle can also be actually a part of your combo turn as well. So if you don't have the Blazing or the Lessons in Lava, sometimes you just have to go off and try and kill your opponent. And Aether Spindle is actually the best card for doing that because you can Wildfire into Spindle and uh, say your Spindle's coming in for, you know, eight or nine because of the buff. You can actually still have another blue in hand, ready to Kano, and you can dig and stack your deck. You can stack it with Tomes so that you can draw net resources. You can just find the Blazing and kill them. There's so many different avenues. Aether Spindle is... It's one of the last cards I would cut if, you know, a lot of other new cards came out and some things started to, you know, have upgrades for Kano. Aether Spindle is the one that I would still be trying to sit on because this card is, is really, really powerful. So that's the main 57 cards, uh, as I say. Now, I will cut some cards in certain matchups if I'm bringing other stuff in. If you do want access to my full sideboard card, that is going to be up on the Arsenal Pass Patreon. You can go and find out uh, how I'm sideboarding into every matchup in this meta, plus some notes on cards that are really priority for Arsenal targets, ways to play the matchup, etc. Um Go check that out. Otherwise, equipment to finish it out on the main core of the deck. Tunic, Crucible of Etherweave, Storm Stratus, Metacarpus Nodes, Rag and Muffins Hat. Don't need to talk too much about this. If you uh, have already watched this video, you're going to know why all these equipment is super important. But I'll talk in the sideboard about some other equipment options. I also want to give you a bit of an understanding of my sideboard. And also, I'm going to chat through some of the options that I think you could pick if your meta is a bit different to maybe what I might expect. Or, uh, you know, there's other options for cards that I think are really powerful in Kano. And you can chop and change, especially some numbers here. You'll see some ones. So I talked about equipment just before we ended the, the core piece there. So let's just talk equipment. Spellfire Cloak. This is basically... So Tunic Defense Form, which is great. But sometimes the game doesn't go long enough or you need to combo before the Tunic's even going to be relevant. Things like Fi, Dromai. So Spellfire Cloak is really great in that slot to come in out of the sideboard. Sometimes you need to kill five before you even get your Tunic on three, and you need that resource. That resource is so, so crucial. So Spellfire Cloak just means that you have it for the combo turn, uh, so that comes in there. And then you've got Illuvian Constellus and Waning Moon, and this is literally Wizard Mirror. This is what these cards are for, uh, allowing us to get the equipment value on the Illuvian Constellus with the, the counter versus Kano or Icelander, and then Waning Moon to chip our opponent. Now, earlier in our testing process for Worlds, Waning Moon was a card that we were playing in a lot of matchups, and uh, shout out to Sasha Markovic. I know he's still a massive fan of Waning Moon. I think at one point he was playing it into basically every single matchup. He was just playing a Waning Moon Kano deck, basically. But the way I look at this is that Crucible of Aetherweave and the Wildfire combo is just so, so powerful that I, again, I don't want to dilute it. And so I'm only bringing this in in matchups where it's going to be super grindy. If you're expecting ultims that are not these sort of the ones we're seeing right now with pummels and a bit more proactive and they're really, really defensive for whatever reason, maybe because of the aggressive metagame then I might look to sort of bring in Waning Moon to be more uh, sort of attrition-based against them. Other than that, we've got Potion of Deja Vu. I talked about this. I play one. A lot of people play two, three because of the powerful effect of it. Yes, it is really good, and it can mean that you just win with awkward hands, hands that have tomes in them. You can do this kind of nutty sort of dig for combo. Again, my viewpoint is it's not a card that helps me with Wildfire combo, and that is the most powerful thing Kana can be doing. I just want consistency. So I do want actually access to Potion of Deja Vu, especially in slow games, because once this is on board, it means that I can turn a potentially sort of awkward hand that has a lot of power in it but doesn't have much resources into just a hand that can just win the game. So I do, do want access to one of those. It's really good against those uh, sort of controlling sort of grindy decks. Chain Lightning, great card if we lose our Storm Striders or our Ragamuffin's Hat to a Expose the Elements. 
This is the same reason Deja Vu is actually really good in those situations. It's going to allow us to still be able to do sort of crazy combo things without one of those pieces of equipment. And Chain Lightning is really good for that. Also, Chain Lightning has a lot of synergy with Snapback and some matchups that we're bringing those in. So great piece there. So over here, we do have a lot of reds and there's some sort of packages I like to call them or options. I'll sort of start at the top here with these two, Voltic Bolt and Aether Quickening. Now, Voltic Bolt is a card that I like to when I want to play two card hands into people. This card you can easily cut for other options. I wanted access to a fourth card that I could bring in for playing really strong two card hands or effectively a, a fourth Swell Tidings. Uh, so I play one of those, but this is a flex spot, I think. Aether Quickening, on the other hand, I really like to go and get off Lessons in Lava into certain matchups. And also when we're playing the Waning Moon plan, Aether Quickening is a card that's fantastic with Waning Moon. Uh, you can even turn this Vaulted Bolt into another Aether Quickening, I think, if you're really concerned about sort of the Icelander matchup. Uh, other than that, Cindering Foresight, again, for slower, more grindy matchups. Again, some of my teammates really like playing this into even aggressive matchups because of the explosive potential that it enables you. Again, you know what I'm going to say. It detracts from the wildfire combo. So I only like to play this and as a one-off into slower matchups where I know that I can sort of pitch for second cycle a bit more. Uh, I'm less concerned about the combo in a fast period of time and I'm more concerned about chipping and pushing big bursts of damage. Cindering Foresight is fantastic at helping you Find some great cards off the top, push some damage, and get a lump of sort of uh, damage in without fear of losing life total on the back end of it. Snapbacks, these are fantastic in the uh, any matchup that is slower when, when you're looking to do tomes out of Arsenal. One of the best things that you can do to swing tempo is tome out of Arsenal, gain up a bunch of life, and then throw a bunch of damage at your opponent, and Snapback is one of the best cards that can help that. Aether Flare for aggro decks, decks that are going to cheat on Nauru, and decks that are going to go sort of low on resources and are going to enable you to find windows to actually push through damage. If it's part of your combo turn, it's Friggin' lethal, but even outside of that, it's just great for pushing damage, and you can be pretty greedy with this sometimes and keep three or four card hands to try and push damage. And then lastly, we have the Dromai package. Three Aether Dart, it's the best card against Dromai. I know people play Singe, I think it's pretty bad to play Singe, and then Dampen is just the next best card, uh, because it does a similar effect. Of course, one resource, to Crucible, then Aether Dart kills a Themai, this kills a Themai. It's the card I care about, because Wildfire Combo is how you're going to kill Dromai and speed trying to attrition them out and go through a long game they're going to win that game with dragons so if you're worried about dromai play extra dampens uh, go up on cards here i wouldn't play singe though the reason people like playing singe is because of the uh the aether ash rings of course but we are going to deal damage we're going to win the game is in the early game yes if they get a turn one rake they've done well and that's going to be awkward but also they don't play that many resources especially these new sort of more aggressive boots don't play that many resources they can't even necessarily use the arcane barrier so I definitely recommend staying away from the Singes and focusing more on the cards that are going to kill the card that is absolutely going to destroy you, which is Themai. Uh, also, Kyloria is not great for you, and this can deal with that. So that's the sideboard. I do just want to talk about some other cards that you could look at as options. Mind Warp is a card that I really, really like, and I think is super interesting. I haven't played with it as much as I would like, but I do think it's really good into sort of these slower grindier matchups. It could replace some of these cards like Snapbacks and during Foresight, uh, even these, depending on what you want to do in that matchup. And I think is potentially a really good option and it's a yellow rather than a red, which I, I quite like, especially when it has a job that these reds are doing. Uh, otherwise, you could trade up some of these Voltic Bolt numbers if you particularly want to go up to, maybe you want to go up to like six sort of of this effect into matchups where you want to play two card hands. Um, I probably wouldn't. I'd probably stay away from them. I think as well, if you're not worried about Icelander and Ultima in particular, I'd probably cut these snapbacks and you can find other sideboard options. So there's a lot of different things you could do. Maybe you really like Potion or Deja Vu and those sorts of lines. You could add more potions, uh, but uh, not mostly for me. So... That's my cyborg package. Again, if you do want to find my full cyborg plan, that is up on the Arsenal Pass Patreon. Mastering Kano doesn't come overnight, but this video right here has given you all the tools you need from beginner to advanced to make sure you can upskill and level up your classic constructed Kano game and take it to the next level. If you're heading to ProQuest Season 3 and taking Kano, I wish you all the best. I think it's a great choice as always, super powerful, and the more you understand Kano, the better your results going to be. If you like this video and you want to see more of these sorts of videos, then drop us a like, leave us a comment, let us know what you liked about it. Me and Brendan are looking to do more of these kind of videos in the future and just want to say a massive thank you for supporting Arsenal Pass. Until next time, we'll see you in the next video.